When people hear the word bank, they usually think of money. But today we want to talk about a different kind of bank. One for things like beans, bananas and barley. Here, what's being stored and saved are seeds, varieties adapted to the changing climate. Welcome to this new edition of Eco Africa. I'm Neo Taegbe and I'm not alone. Sandra Twinobio in Uganda is with me. What can you tell us about seed banks, Sandra? It is nice to see you to Niota. Well, I know that in Western Uganda, farmers have teamed up with a seed bank to enable them grow healthy and nutritional crops for their communities. More on that in a moment, but first a look at what else is in the program. We will take a look at a plant in Ethiopia that generates electricity while eliminating waste. And we will also hear how cargo bikes are making road traffic a little greener in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. We start the program right here in Uganda. Around 10 years ago, Joy Mujisha and a few other farmers used a few bags of beans and banana seeds as startup capital to set up the Chiziba Community Seed Bank. And the concept has proved fruitful. Yields in the region's bean harvest have risen up by 50%. And a big factor in its success is that the initiative banks on knowledge sharing. Anyone wanting to use the seeds is given some training too. Joy Mugisha is explaining how to catch banana weevils. She's giving a training session to women farmers in western Uganda. This is the solution of water, a salt and water to cure the banana weevils. Here, she demonstrates another method. Put parts of a dead banana tree stump in front of the tree you're trying to protect, and the weevils will be drawn to that instead. We usually teach our farmers not to use chemicals because it destroys our soils. You know the soil has microorganisms. When you spray chemicals, so it, it kills microorganisms, which is too bad to our, our environment. Joy Mugisha has been trained by the organization Alliance Bioversity. The NGO supports food security projects with evidence-based research, especially for crops like bananas and beans. Some traditional bean varieties can no longer grow here. The farmers say it's because of climate change. The NGO has helped them to set up their own cooperative and develop a seed bank, which now has more than 60 varieties of bean in stock. During the planting season, our farmers are, have an opportunity to access seed from here. They, 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 if, some, if a farmer, he or she takes one kilogram, he has to, at, at, after harvesting, he or she has to pay back twice as much. The National Seed Bank of Uganda provided the initial investment of seeds. Scientists made them available to the NGO. The researchers have given the farmers improved seeds of bean varieties. The cross-breeding to create these new strands can take several years, as scientist Gloria Otino explains. You will find beans rich in zinc, beans rich in calcium, beans maybe that are rich in selenium. Breeders can access those materials and improve on them in terms of yield or disease management or even nutrition. So those traditional varieties hold a lot of traits and genetic diversity that we need for, for breeding. The National Seed Bank estimates that every year, Uganda is losing around 10% of its biodiversity in plants that are important for agriculture and nutrition, like beans, peanuts, and wild rice. So if we lose that variation within each of those crops, then we'll have, we'll have nothing because we will not be able to use that materials to engage the challenges that you have in the production systems. A country which does not look after these resources is, is a country that is in trouble for the future. Joy Mugisha has in the meantime set up her own seed bank. For four years, she's been setting aside part of her harvest for seeds. She's employed a number of women to help with the seed selection process. She not only pays them, but also passes on her bean-growing knowledge. They get money from this 
community, um, they learn from this community and go and teach other, other farmers. The idea of starting up community seed banks is catching on. Joy Mugisha has also found interested listeners in the neighboring district of Shima. A total of eight cooperatives in Uganda have now joined the initiative. Well, small adjustments can often bring about big changes, but sometimes it really does take massive investment. Ethiopia has just spent a million setting up a power station at its capital Koshe's dump site that is using the waste there to generate power. The garbage is incinerated to heat water and produce steam, which drives a turbine. The plant now supplies a quarter of the city's households with electricity. Sounds like two problems solved at once. These mounts of trash are valuable. They are reused to produce energy for Addis Ababa. This incineration plant called Repi is the first of its kind in Africa. It produces electricity for Ethiopia's capital city. Every day around 2,000 tons of garbage are delivered here. Two-thirds of that is burned. First, the waste is stored at the bunker for five days to release moisture. Then it is burned at a temperature between 800 and 850 degrees Celsius. Chemist Sinta Yehu Melaku has been working here since the opening of the plant. The trash come in and burn it after that it will be uh, heat the water, the water will create steam, that steam uh, rotate the turbine, the turbine generate electricity. The filters of the incinerators are made to EU standards so that as little pollution as possible leaks into the air. That makes it more eco-friendly than open burning of waste on landfills, which is still common in African countries. The plant was built on parts of the former Koshe dump site at the outskirts of the city. The director, Alemayehu Neme, says that Koshe served for about 50 years to discard the waste of Addis. His administration has transformed the dump site into a managed landfill. This keeps away fires and bad odor through waste treatment and gas venting. There are a number of wastes that is not, never accepted by this uh, waste to energy because they are not burned. Uh, so that uh, those wastes which cannot be burned and which can uh, danger this facility will be disposed on the landfill. The Repi incineration plant was constructed and funded by an international consortium and the Ethiopian government. It provides electricity to around 25% of households in Addis Ababa. Huh? It is uh, it, low capacity, 25 megawatt, but it, it, it is contributing for uh, cleaning the city. It is contributing for uh, adding some uh, energy to the system. So it will serve as a model for other cities to uh, cleaning the city. Of course, coal-fired power plants or gas facilities are more efficient in making electricity than this incineration plant. But this waste-to-energy system is not only generating electricity, it is also saving land space, preventing the release of toxic chemicals into groundwater and reducing the release of methane into the atmosphere. Nice, that looks pretty impressive. But unfortunately, not all countries here in Africa have the means to do things like that. But that doesn't mean there are no other creative ideas for processing trash. Indeed, Sandra. For instance, in Ghana, one innovator is transforming plastic waste into a leather-like material to produce a fashionable footwear. Here's this week's Doing Your Bit. Fancy a pair of these slick-looking sandals? They're another step forward in the fight for the environment. Makafu Yabuku came up with an idea to transform plastic waste into a leather-like material. 
He wanted cleaner streets in Ghana's capital and got going with startup help from the World Bank. He has a team collecting plastic in Accra. Residents can collect cash for bringing him the material themselves. We created a sustainable process around the whole thing and we wanted to engage communities and people. Okay. So we, we encourage homes and offices and individuals to separate their waste and aggregate it for a while. Then they bring it to us, we weigh it, and we exchange it for money. The plastic is shredded, heated up, and then pressed into sheets. The new material is easy to work with. McAfee cuts out the pattern for sandals and takes the pieces to somebody who sews them together. For now, the orders have been filled from home. But the innovator is hoping to see his shoes in the shop soon. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Nigeria has many rivers, lakes and lagoons and a long coastline, but these are being devastated by vast amounts of plastic waste. It is destroying habitats and killing animals and equipment too. Something urgently needs to be done and there are people who are rising to the challenge. EcoPro is one of those. It's a non-governmental in Lagos that is committed to clearing plastic from the ocean and the shores. With its impressive skyline and expensive yachts, the lagoon in Lagos is a picture of luxury and charm. But only at first glance. A closer look reveals the darker sides. The lagoon is a cesspool of plastic waste. A group of environmental activists called EcoPro is fighting against it. They've been collecting trash here since 2019 to protect the environment and the people who live here. The fishes in the water that we eat, they eat this and all of that. We are blocking our waterways. We are blocking the drainages. We are blocking the canals. At the end of the day, our streets will be flooded. We need to stop this. Look at everywhere. The activists go out once a week to clean up the lagoon. It's estimated that 12,000 metric tons of waste are dropped here every day. The NGO workers pay to rent the boats with their own money, but the owners give them a lower rate to help out. The banana boats cost about 30,000, but because we are in sort of relationship with, um, with the owners, they just give us some discounts. Why the bigger boats are about 70,000 Naira because of the um, relationships that we have with them. EcoPro also receives help from a private waste disposal company which clears waste from the lagoon for free. Plastic is a recyclable material, but much of it still ends up in landfill. Recycling does exist here, but it's rudimentary. It's really just a dump site, but um, what we do have, we have pickers who go to the dump site and they then individually take out the things which have, they have a lot of value. I mean, we, we're literally throwing away money. They have a lot of value, so they pick them out and take them, they sell them off to the different people who are doing the recycling. Up to a hundred workers help with the cleanups on a regular basis. The activists want to foster more public awareness about the environment to help change people's behavior. If only people can imbibe good culture whereby you drink it, you put it in your bag and trash it more later where you can find the trash can. EcoPro has also started to collect garbage on beaches. Sometimes they are able to recruit extra volunteers spontaneously. When I heard about this, I just felt that Oh, this is a worthy cause to come be a part of. I could have been anywhere. I could have been at my factory, any of the stores all around Lagos. But come on, there's nothing like keeping Mother Nature. An estimated 450,000 metric tons of trash are dropped in the lagoon and on the beaches every year. The activists hope the government in Lagos will step in soon to do more than it's doing now. And that way, the waste here will be cleared every day. Albatrosses are among the largest seabirds and they are one of the most threatened families of birds on earth. 
albatrosses feed on squids, fish and krill. So it's not surprising that they are attracted to large fishing vessels that troll the oceans. And while the bar yacht may be too good to resist, the boats are actually more of a curse and a blessing to these majestic creatures. Let's see this. With a wingspan of up to three and a half meters, the wandering albatross may be the most majestic seabird in the southern hemisphere and one of its most endangered bird species. Here on the French Crozet Islands, an archipelago in the Southern Ocean, Henri Weimerskirch and his team equipped the birds with transmitters. Since last autumn, they've been tracking the flight of the albatrosses. Weimerskirch has been fascinated with these seabirds ever since he was a boy. Albatrosses fly at speeds of 70 to 80 kilometers an hour over stormy seas without flapping their wings. They use the wind to get around. But it's true there's something majestic and fantastic about the flight of the albatross. When you go to the sea, every ornithologist dreams of catching a glimpse of one. Yet such encounters are increasingly rare because the number of wandering albatrosses has shrunk dramatically in recent years. Researchers estimate that there are only some 25,000 left worldwide. Albatrosses often follow boats in search of food. The first time I saw one, I was on the boat taking us over to the Crozet Islands. The bird just came out of nowhere. The sea was choppy and we saw the albatross approach the boat, pass over it and fly alongside the vessel. It observed us and then vanished again into the sea. The birds mainly follow fishing boats. Unfortunately, many fishermen cast kilometre-long lines equipped with dozens of hooks. While trying to take the bait, albatrosses often swallow the hooks and die a painful death. The boats are usually unlicensed and don't send out the required automatic identification signals. They also don't employ safety measures like weighted lines, which can be immediately pulled down far below the water's surface. Marine biologists are concerned. The problem with international waters is they're a rights-free zone. International organizations don't have the legal instruments to force these boats to stop their unauthorized fishing. So Henri Weimerskirch and his colleagues launched their Ocean Sentinel research project to find another way of combating illegal fishing. They've now fitted 170 birds with radar transmitters which can even track down boats that aren't sending out the required signal. This here is a transmitter. It has a GPS antenna which allows it to locate the exact spot where the radar was detected. Then another antenna transmits the data directly to us via satellite. The scientists compared the data gathered by the birds with that from authorised fishing boats. They found that around 30% of the vessels out at sea lacked permits. The researchers say there are indications some of the boats are sailing under Chinese and Spanish flags. An accusation that Spain's Director General of Sustainable Fisheries categorically rejects. The vessels that we are operating in this ocean, or whatever ocean, that were flying the flag uh, of Spain uh, are well controlled, uh, we monitored all of them and it's impossible that we are not aware of their activities. But the ornithologists trust their research. They're certain their data could help to stop illegal fishing and save albatrosses in the process. Just as in many other parts of the world, traffic is a major problem in Africa's mega cities. Some people need up to three hours just to get to work. Never mind all the small delivery trucks that are frequently stuck in traffic jams. And it's not just time wasted, is it, Niota? Take Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Its population has doubled over the last 20 years, and the increase in traffic is terrible in terms of carbon emissions and air quality. But that's just one reason eco minded entrepreneurs are making the switch to electromobility. 
It's still early when Leroy Miner heads into the poverty-stricken districts of Nairobi to deliver fresh produce. Leroy gets around on a solar-powered cargo e-bike. Uh, full battery charge uh, on such a day, it can do you a good 60 kilometers. And uh, if on a solar, uh, like a, sun day, a sunny day, uh, a full battery charge can take you up to 100 kilometers. So the panels gives you an extra range when it's sunny. The bike can reach a speed of 40 kilometers an hour, even when it's carrying a heavy load. The solar panel on the roof protects Leroy from the rain, and the battery keeps charging even in this kind of weather. Leroy works for a local company called Kwanza Tukula. It supplies pre-prepared staple foods to street food vendors in mostly impoverished neighbourhoods. We want to be sustainable, that's the number one driver, but also we want to be economically sustainable so that we're able to produce products that are affordable for our customers who are mainly the poor. And in order to do that, we find it more efficient to use green energy. The solar bikes that we use, um, we don't pay any fuel for them and they're able to carry more cargo compared to a motorbike. The electric cargo bike was developed by the startup Solar eCycles. Sustainable mobility is wonderful because it's, one, it's good for the environment, uh, especially in Kenya and in Africa where our population will grow massively over the next 20 to 30 years. So the environmental case is a very strong case that we always have to make. The number of vehicles driving on gasoline or diesel is on the rise in African cities, worsening air pollution and increasing carbon emissions. The United Nations Environment Programme, UNEP, is therefore promoting electromobility in Africa. In Kenya, the biggest emission when it comes to climate change is the transport sector. And the biggest polluter when it comes to health is the transport sector. And within the transport sector, these old dirty motorcycles are one of the biggest polluters. So we want to replace them completely with zero emissions electric motorcycles like this one. In Kenya, some 80% of the electricity in the country derives from renewables, such as solar and wind power and geothermal energy. Ideal conditions for e-mobility. And yet there are just 300 electric mopeds on the busy streets of the Kenyan capital. The main obstacle to e-mobility in Kenya is inadequate infrastructure. And for car drivers, the battery range is too limited. Plus, there are hardly any charging stations. For electric cars to be mainstream, people say we need chargers, we need fast chargers. But for fast chargers to be established, we need electric cars. So there must be, you mu there must be that group of people that's willing to take the fast risk. There is demand for electric vehicles, in conservation areas, for example, and wildlife reserves such as Old Pajeta, four hours north of Nairobi. This Land Cruiser used to be gas-driven, but it's been retrofitted with a super-quiet electric engine, a major advantage here in the savannah. What I like about it is the silence. When you're driving um, close to the animals, animals don't um, hear it, so they don't get disturbed. You can approach the animals and you can stop Feel the or observe the animals, you move without starting, unlike the other vehicle which uses fuel. This safari jeep was converted by Swedish company Opibus. The company has set up shop in Kenya with 40 employees and installs electric engines in cars and motorbikes and soon buses too. Going forward, we will go more and more towards, um, towards manufacturing of uh, a deeper and deeper level, which means that we can make Kenya into the actual uh, central hub for electric vehicles of this region. And we can move away from importing these vehicles. For the time being, at least though, electric vehicles remain something of a niche market in Kenya. A lot of ground will have to be covered before they go mainstream and the air quality in Nairobi improves.
that is certainly an interesting approach and it is good to know that the electric cargo bikes work in the rain too. Maybe the idea will catch on in other African countries as well, maybe here in Uganda as well. We've come to the end of this week's Eco Africa. We're glad you could join us and of course we hope you've been able to pick up a few ideas and insights you can use wherever you live. I am Sandra Trinovio saying bye here in Kampala, the capital of Uganda. So long for now, Sandra, and goodbye to you, our dear viewers out there. See you again next week. Until then, you can stay in touch with us and keep up with the latest development on our social media channels. For now, I'm Neil Taigwe signing up from the Lufasi Park in Lagos, Nigeria. <laughs>